risks and gaps when it comes to real estate. There are eight. I'm going to give them to you so you can start to learn it. Insurance risk, liquidity risk, operational cost risk, capital cost risk, location rent gap, disinvestment rent gap, market rent gap, and tenant rent gap. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a code cracker, I'm telling you, we're going to explore some risks when it comes to the type of properties you can buy in the real estate marketplace. We're also going to explore some cash flow gaps from real estate that too many property investors today have in the real estate marketplace. A lot of people don't become proficient investors because they don't concentrate on the results. And a lot of that stems from how they buy real estate in the beginning, what type of assets they actually choose from the get-go. And as real estate is time-bound, a lot of these problems unfold as you go through the journey of property investing. So today we're going into risks and gaps of real estate investment. Yes. Does that sound riveting? Well, we never know until we get to the end with the urban property investor, whether it's a good show or absolutely terrible. So you're going to have to stick around. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, I apologize for my look. I look like I'm, uh, you know, doing cars at Lake Weirdo, stealing handbags out of cars or something. Um, yes, I have a Kogan led uh, wardrobe. Yes. A lot of my clothes I buy daily from Kogan to look as terrible as I possibly can. So I apologize if you're watching on YouTube that I do come across like a little, uh, I don't know, little Gopnik from, you know, an unsavory part of the world, a disinvested part of the world. We're going to talk about disinvestment today and what that actually means. I've seen many places crumble in front of my eyes when it comes to property investment. Many places where basically human beings abandon and leave and disappear from. And of course, uh, the overall appeal of properties in those areas just decline in value exponentially. We're going to talk about that. So I think when it comes to property investment, like we got to have a bit of a goal. I like the idea that whether we buy as a property investment, one investment property or five investment properties or seven investment properties, that we get ourselves to a point where we've got uh, an income profile from those properties we've put together. I like the idea of $2 million worth of real estate. I've been open about that. The reason being $2 million worth of real estate can throw out $100,000 passive income on a 5% plus return. And of course, uh, the journey of putting that together takes time. As I've openly talked about on this podcast many times, you know, when you get to clear air of over $2 million worth of real estate, it becomes much easier property investment because for a million dollars worth of real estate to go to $2 million worth of real estate, you need a hundred percent return. But uh, obviously compounding growth means 2 million to 3 million is not a hundred percent return. It's 50% return. And things just get easier the more wealth you've got, but it is a journey. Real estate is a time bound journey. And what I see too often from property investment is the idea that Property investors don't get themselves into a position over time where they're geared, where the real estate is paying an income to the property investor, where rents have improved over time, where if interest rates change and transformation unfolds, the assets are really run by the core principle of the yield. And of course, as we all know in real estate, the best real estate produces the best capital growth. The A-grade properties produce the best capital growth. 
Uh, but we need to balance our portfolio as a property investor so that we can make sure we're not tipping in too much out of our own back pocket. And of course, this leads us to two principles, value investing and total return. Value investing is just the idea that you do have to moderate the concept of balancing your income profile from the property with the capital growth of the property. Obviously, the best properties in the market are very uh, negatively geared. They've got a very low yield, like 1%, but they perform the best when it comes to growth. But to buy that growth, you're having to dig out of your back pocket quite often. So I like the idea of value properties. The value is there. The yields kind of take care of business. There's three logics when it comes to cash flow. There's you, the tax man, and of course, the tenant. And if you can get the tax man and the tenant doing the line share of the work, you tend to be able to own real estate without digging into your back pocket constantly, which I love. And of course, one of the big conversations around real estate is how to rents in a very, very tough marketplace at times double in value. How do rents actually also grow exponentially? Now think about it, if we had a million dollar property and we just basically applied a 5% growth rate, which is a good, uh, I think a fair growth rate in the marketplace, it's going to take about 15 years for that property to double in value. The same concept relates to uh, the rent of a property. But the problem with the rent of a property is rents are very much tied to wages. And of course, if wages are moderately growing, then uh, rents can suffer the challenge of not growing as fast as properties grow in value. And of course, the day you buy a property really the rental performance begins. Now, I own a lot of real estate and uh, I've owned real estate for longer than 15 years. And with some of my real estate, I've seen the rents climb in value and basically double. And in other real estate, which I own, I've seen rents really not go up much at all over that period of time. So I've always been fascinated with the concept of working out how to make sure I'm going to create the best cash flow from my assets that I buy because after all, I'm doing this because I want income in retirement from real estate. And again, that may mean like if you buy two or three properties, whatever it may be, that you sell some to pay down debt and you end up in a positive cash flow position from real estate. It's going to take some work to do this. This is not something that can happen in two years, five years. This is a 20 plus year process. So it's very, very important some of the questions which are going to arise when it comes to real estate ownership. You know, I think it's quite often common to question, well, where will capital growth come from from this real estate? Why is this real estate interesting? Why is it scarce? Why would the opinion of real estate be better on the growth of that asset into the future? Why would someone pay more for that property into the future? But the same question needs to be applied to the uh, cash flow side of real estate. Why would someone rent that property for more into the future? And today, I really want to sort of break down what goes wrong because cash flow improving over time is as much about what can go wrong and what the risks and gaps are for property investors as it is to just sticking to the fundamentals, a good location usually means a good uh, socioeconomic underbelly, which means uh, into the future, things are going to improve. Improvement happens over time. But let's get into it. Risks and gaps when it comes to real estate. There are eight. I'm going to give them to you so you can start to learn it. 
insurance risk, liquidity risk, operational cost risk, capital cost risk, location rent gap, disinvestment rent gap, market rent gap, and tenant rent gap. We're going to go through these, right? I call it like the hub and spoke model. And again, if you think about like a wheel, right, it's like you got your property and then um, you've got spokes that go out to the rubber. The rubber meets the road. That's the kind of concept. So it's these spokes, like they, they pour out and we've got to go out to these, uh, to these risks that can happen in real estate. Now, quite often when we focus on real estate, it's usually at the buying part. It's not at the whole part which is a little bit perverted because really the buying part is just a 30 or 42 day process. The owning part is a 20 plus year process. So it's much more elongated. You'll feel real estate more once you own it than being excited about buying it. This is where I think too many people get uh, you know, a little bit carried away with, ah, oh, you know, you paid too much for that property. Oh, mate, I paid 20 grand more, too, too much, you know, big whoop. Uh, you went to auction, you got carried away on an A-grade property, you know. Um, again, like the actual fundamentals of price and opinion and that real estate is a consensus business is – is not really the risk of real estate. You know, you can have a valuer go to a property on the same day from three different valuation firms and get three different numbers. You can have real estate agents go to a property on uh, the same day, three different real estate agents, three different numbers. You can have three buyers go to a property on the same day, you know, three different um, opinions, three different numbers when it comes to price. You can have... Uh, again, three different buyer's agents go to a property and, and one buyer's agent will pay full ass, the other will pay less, right? It's an opinion-based sport. And of course, this is why so many people encourage people to buy interesting real estate because interesting equals good opinion, right? And so uh, again, um, buying the real estate is not so much the problem of real estate. Real estate is time bound, takes a little bit of time to do its thing. And uh, again, if you start out choosing the wrong property, you're going to enable more risk for that property to do its thing. And there's going to be more gaps surrounding that property. So the first risk, if you like, when it comes to real estate, there's four risks, four gaps. The first risk is insurance risk, insurance risk. Second risk, liquidity risk, the ability to sell that property if you need to. Third risk, operational. Fourth risk, capital costs. We're going to go through some of these risk so you can start to think about this stuff, right? Now, when you think about insurance risk, like quite often, uh, you know, property investors, you know, can't comp contemplate that. But if you buy in the wrong location, uh, a location which is flood affected, a location perhaps where climate resilience is going to change, if you buy in an area which is cyclone, uh, problematic if you buy in potentially a volatile part of Australia. When you look at a map of Australia, it's huge, right? We have a massive continent, but we're a very dry continent, and most people fundamentally live in the southeastern part of the continent. A lot of Australia is uninsurable, and insurance risk is something that is going to develop over time. It is going to go with you through your property investment journey. It's going to be something which you're going to have to navigate through if climate impacts continue. Uh, I mean, it's been raining and raining and raining this year. You're going to see more and more challenges when it comes to insurance. And of course, the cost for the insurer to deliver the insurance is going to be more and more expensive in the wrong neighborhoods. 
And I say that because insurance premiums will fundamentally go up for everyone, but wrong neighborhood insurance premiums will probably come to the point where you cannot actually create an income out of real estate, where the insurance cost to run that real estate is too expensive, if you like, when converted to your rental dollars. Now, I've had this and I've mentioned this once or twice uh, on this podcast. I am a victim, if you want to call it that. I mean, I don't like that word, but I don't know what else to say of, of climate change, right? I owned a beautiful property on a beach in northern uh, Queensland. Mate, cyclones happen every week. Uh, it is uninsurable. I had to offload that property and of course, I took a hit on that property because it became uninsurable. When I bought it, it was insurable. By the time I'd gone through uh, a process of owning it, uh, things changed underneath me. And the best way to avoid that is really to stick to uh, climate resilient places, areas in the southeast of Australia, if you like, from really Brisbane to Adelaide and below, um, you could probably throw Perth in there because uh, it's it's also fundamentally lower uh, down on that side of the continent. You know, you can't get insurance past the, what is it, the Tropic of Capricorn on a lot of properties. So insurance risk is a real challenge for property investors. And uh, again, I think, you know, we need to insure up and insurance costs are going to follow us. You know, we need landlord insurance. We need building and contents insurance. We need, at times, income protection insurance. We need life insurance. And all of this is a umbrella, if you like, trying to protect us when it comes to property. And of course, again, a lot of this uh, is sometimes not noted when you buying the property you might go to a very cheap part of town and think well you know it's uh it's a bargain but you know there's some pretty there's some pretty amazing studies around at the moment when it comes to certain suburbs you know starting to be almost desert like because they just are not climate resilient and again just got to be very, very mindful when it comes to property investment, you know, stick to the fundamentals so that you do not run into an insurance risk. The next risk, if you like, is a liquidity risk when it comes to real estate. And again, like liquidity is the idea that uh, if you need to sell the property, you need the demand of the market to be there the less demand within the market for that asset, the more difficult that asset actually is to sell. Now, if you go to suburbs which are going to be, you know, fundamentally broke, uh, low social socioeconomics, deprived marketplaces, full of crime, uh, and you think that's a smart idea to invest in those neighbourhoods, the day you go to sell when the market is more normal, and remember we've just come through a very perverted time when it comes to the speed of the market, it may be very, very difficult for you to sell that asset. And again, the liquidity risk for real estate is huge. It's not a share. It's not a fast-moving vehicle real estate. So the only way to avoid a problem with future liquidity is to provide good shelter in a good community and you'll absolutely be able to make wealth out of a property investment that follows that mantle. Now, remember, there are so many places in real estate terms that lack liquidity. It can take literally a year and a half to sell a property in some of these places. Now, uh, a few years back, I had a property in Moree. Yes, Moree. Moree is probably the strangest town in Australia. Yes, Moree uh, is a cotton town. Moree uh, is full of old people 
that basically have arthritis that go to this town to go in the thermal pools, which make their bones feel better. Now, don't ask me why I invested in Maury. It's a long, long, long story. But I can tell you what, uh, selling a property in that marketplace takes a bloody long time. You're not expecting to get your money back in 30 days. No way. I mean, you potentially go through three different real estate agents just to move the goddamn property, particularly if it's on the wrong side of the tracks, which, lo and behold, I bought a property on the wrong side of the tracks. So I've learned from these mistakes by doing them, not just, uh, I'm not just trying to scare people here unnecessarily. I've put myself in a position where I've had real estate that no one wants. Now, I think a lot of property investors often buy real estate with a little trigger in the background that uh, if shit goes down, they could live in the property and they'd be happy. And I actually don't mind that principle. You know, if it's good enough for you to live in, it's probably a good investment property. Um, and I think a lot of people went through the fad of like, well, you just buy on the numbers and, you know, uh, property investment's just a spreadsheet kind of, you know, you put it through the calculator and it comes up with some sort of numerical n number that <coughs> unfolds into the future. And, it, you know, it doesn't really work like that. Undesirable properties, properties falling down, uh, you know, most people don't want to buy a property that they have to take on a huge $100,000 plus renovation. Most people don't want to buy a project. So if you're holding a much, uh, you know, a, an asset which is a real ugly asset in potentially an undesirable neighborhood, in an undesirable street, you know, you're potentially sitting on something which I would refer to as a bit of a time bomb. It's, it's, it could blow up on you. It's a real risk. And again, you know, there's advocates for... Um, you know, all types of properties in the marketplace. And again, uh, I'm very, very mindful to just comprehend that we just want something that uh, is going to, you know, be a stable property to the next person. In other words, they don't see any danger signals when they look at the property should you need to sell it. And I guess I've always been a little bit wary of, for example, holiday suburbs in strange coastal locations because in a downturn, in a money recall, in a, you know, uh, in, a, in a period of time where you've got, you know, financial stress, you know, the stock market's not working, there's just financial chaos – what happens is a lot of people get rid of discretionary assets. They cut discretionary spending. And so, you know, into the future, it's going to be interesting, do discretionary places implode? And when things go down in uh, economically and there's a bit of an implosion in real estate, it's quite often holiday marketplaces which feel the brunt of it. Um, I remember after the GFC, you know, places like the entrance on the central coast of Sydney was just, it was a bloodbath. Like uh, every third house was trying to be sold in, the, uh, in that particular neighbourhood. Same in places like Port Douglas, you know, like, all of these holiday places which are boom time real estate that people are like, ah, oh, it's booming, man. Let's get a holiday house. Um, you know, some of these places implode. And I think, you know, there's a lot of logic around second home markets as well as 
um, you know, people obviously moving to the regions, which I think is great because, you know, if you're two, maybe 2.5 hours from a major center, you're going to see stability around those marketplaces. It's the stuff a little bit further afield, I think, which will definitely in the holiday section of the market, again, probably no doubt have a correction when it comes to its sale price. Liquidity, the market changes. And when um, a market changes, it can be pretty interesting to watch, right? Because you can see that even the banks don't want to lend in those marketplaces. So all of a sudden, you know, you might have bought a property on a 90% loan to value ratio, but the next person coming into that suburb has to buy on a 70% loan to value ratio, meaning that next buyer has to come up with a 30% deposit to buy the property, which is illiquid. And of course, um, this is one of the challenges and risks for real estate is if you buy in a terrible place and it gets blacklisted, then the next buyer can't borrow to enter into the market. So you get trapped longer. And for many property investors, you get trapped to the point where you actually can't sell your property. And so it's very, very important. I know property investment over the last sort of two years feels like a bit of a game. You know, it's like, you know, everything's sort of being gamified these days. It feels like, ah, oh, yeah, you just can't lose. But no, you can. You can lose in real estate. I like people to stick to major urban land masses because the volatility of loss is less and the better the suburb the more liquid the suburb is in bad times. So very, very important to understand that risk of real estate. The next risk, if you like, is operational costs. Now, operating costs or operating expenses, if you like, are basically the reoccurring expenses to maintain the rental property and keep it in good condition. Now, the challenge we have as property investors is the inflation on operation costs can outweigh the future rental increase for our asset. Now, it costs the same amount to employ a strata manager in Double Bay as it does in Lake Weirdo. It costs uh, sometimes even more to pay for rates and council rates in smaller marketplaces because of the aggregate size than bigger marketplaces. So as a property investor, we're going to have to pay things like insurances, utilities, uh, professional services like an accountant fee or a planner. We're going to have to pay things like taxes. We're going to have to pay things like uh, letting fees, advertising costs to rent our property, uh, repairs, uh, basically maintenance of the property. And again, um, if the property that we own is has a problem with its cash flow profile, we can see the scales become disproportionate to the point where the property is just bleeding operational costs and there is less rental performance to weigh against the operational costs. And of course, there are so many, many properties which are just operationally harder to run. If you think about a property which has had minimal improvements over the years, that's 60 years old, um, and, you know, you've got uh, uh, problems with that property uh, from the maintenance, it can suck your cash flow apart. Now, I've had this problem <laughs> before too. I uh, certainly have become smarter through real estate by creating my own mistakes in life. But again, like um, if you think about 
you know, the cost to get a plumber to fix a toilet or, I don't know, put some new taps on or whatever it may be, you know, it's three, four, five, six hundred dollars. Then you think about, well, my property only rents for two hundred and twenty dollars a week or two hundred and eighty dollars a week. All of a sudden, just that, uh, you know, uh, basic repair has sucked two weeks worth of cash flow out of your property. And if that happens three, four, five times a year, you're going to run into a absolute mess when it comes to your asset. You won't want to hold it. You'll start to get rid of it because operationally it's a menace. It's a menace property. And uh, I guess my first year in real estate, I was a property manager, which um, which was a, a great time looking back on my property career. Um, actually, within a week, I became the property manager. I basically got a job uh, close to where I uh, grew up and um, the son of the owner was the property manager and I was kind of like the assistant property manager. I'd just been, um, you know, basically was going through a diploma in real estate at the time at TAFE and um, yeah, you know, the father and son had a bit of a barney and uh, two weeks later, a week later after starting, I was put in charge, you know, sink or swim. But what was so fascinating about that job was that I got to see how properties, uh, you know, some of the better properties had less problems. Like there were properties in your portfolio as a property manager. You never heard a peep from the people who live there and they never once had a repair or something to improve. Then you just had like, you know, it was like the 80-20 rule, you know, like uh, you literally spent 80% of your time on 20% of the portfolio was just, just rotten, like repair, like literally the repair people would probably go to those assets 15 times a year. No, no joke. Like there was always something breaking, you know, the gas stove break, it needed a new element. Uh, the water heater system would go. Um, there'd be a roof leak. The gutters uh, would start to spill over. The back fence was falling down. Um, you know, you name it, it was just a, a absolute minefield when it comes to the risk of real estate. And again, like we're talking about, you know, we want to get to a place in life where our cash flow is working for us. And I always find operational risk is one thing that too many property investors don't consider because, you know, what it costs today to deliver a service from a plumber into the future 20 years from now, when you're retiring 30 years from now, what are the operational costs going to be on the property that you own? You know, is it going to be simple because it's actually not a old property by then? It's or is it is it actually going to mean your property is starting to be past its use by date, where you just uh, you just basically operationally are in in a bit of a nightmare, in a reoccurring absolute nightmare? And again, I think because like a lot of the conversation to property investment is is to, to you know basically people buying properties. So they don't want to hear this stuff. And even if they do hear this stuff, they don't particularly care because it doesn't, it's not something that they're going to even um, walk into until 10, 20, 30 years from now. But uh, wouldn't it be nice just to, you know, pick something that is better build, a more modern asset, which has got the ability for um, future opportunity, whether that's through improving the property um, by up updating it um, over time or whether it's just in a really good location, right? I don't like the idea of mounting operational costs. And I've, I guess, got the lashes on the back from that one personally. The next cost, if you like, from uh, real estate, which is a risk, is capital costs. Capital is uh, the idea that you've got a massive lump sum of money and uh 
you know, you want to spread that capital out. You, you potentially want to buy another property or you potentially want to invest in shares or whatever it may be with capital. You don't want it sucked into uh, real estate to improve the value of real estate if your capital is going to be stuck in the property. Now, uh, again, like there is the idea that you can renovate for profit, which um, again is a little bit more of a unicorn than you potentially realize. Uh, then there's the idea that you can overcapitalize when it comes to capital costs. And then there's the idea you can undercapitalize. And I think one of the biggest risks that property investors have is, is um, a rising capital works future fund. Now, again, as opposed to capital costs, as opposed to repairs and maintenance is basically the idea that you maintain or restore your rental property in its original uh, condition or you improve its condition beyond its original state. So again, like um, I'm all for improving properties and spending some money on capital costs. And I teach the 1030 rule, which is the idea that every 10 years you own a property or the eight or the property, I'll start again. Every 10 years old the property is, you're going to need about $30,000 to improve the property. So if it's 20 years old, you're going to need 60,000. If it's 30 years old, you're going to need 90,000. If it's 40 years old, you're probably going to need about $120,000 to update that property and its functionality. There is a lot of dysfunctional dwellings in the marketplace. Now, again, like if your battle plan is to buy an asset, let it rot, uh, hope the land value goes up, and basically collect uh, inferior cash flow and in basically, you know, fundamentally have some irresponsible tenants, then I don't know why you would want that plan, but hey, all power to you. Now, I'll go back a step. Um, when I was a property manager, 18 years old, uh, one of the assets which was located actually in uh, in Ride, uh, which is a sort of suburb of, of Sydney, at the time was going through this. This was the landlord's approach. Never spend a cent on anything um, operational. Don't improve the property. And at the time, the previous property manager rented the property to uh, a person that person simply stopped paying rent because they were in a very, very shit property. They themselves were, they were basically, uh, a, 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 you know, an undesirable human being. And then all that happened to masterfully create wealth out of just never looking after the asset was challenges and to the point where that person basically squatted for over a year before they were removed from the property. Now, again, like uh, this, that's probably an extreme conversation around it, but this stuff does happen. The more your property is undercapitalized, the more dangerous that property becomes for your overall wealth plan. So you've got to actually factor in capital costs. And I think a lot of people, when they buy um, older properties, now I, I'm not advocating that, you know, new property is better than older property. I think, I think all properties, to be brutally honest with you, create opportunity. I think if you buy a property where people want to live, um, whether it's more modern or more, more old, you know, if you know what you're doing, you're going to be absolutely fine. Again, I think there's too much of this banter around. Well, you know, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, bias kind of opinions, right? I think we should all, as an industry, just go. Well, there's good and bad in everything, and uh, 
you know, but I do think when real estate investors buy much older property, they should factor in capital costs. They, you're going to have to improve that property unless it's renovated perfectly the day you buy it. Um, you're going to have to improve it. Now, Suncorp, which is a bank, has uh, some statistics when it comes to the average amount people need to spend on renovation when they buy a property. And it sits around sort of sixty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars, depending on location. I'm sure that's gone up since that report has uh, transpired because of inflation and so forth. So again, if you imply if you apply an inflation rate like CPI to uh, properties, then you've got to comprehend that the CPI actually goes to the unimproved capital value, the unimproved capital cost. So you've got to then think about, well, um, if I'm just going to buy a property and not do anything to it, and I don't have the budget to do it, well, again, you're like, um, unless you're depreciating and getting a return out of that money, then again, like, you're basically going to have to plan to replace, plan to replace. This is the capital cost conversation, you know, uh, and there's so many like items in a house that add no value to the rental market once you do replace them. Think about gutters. How does that add any value to to real estate, right? Think about, um, you know, removing a tree. Um, quite often adds no value to real estate. Um Then you've got things which can improve your real estate. Things like better locks, shutters, curtains. These may be things you need to explore to to improve the capital worth of your property. Decking, uh, upgrading a kitchen, upgrading a bathroom, upgrading a carport to a garage, adding some fencing can, you know, these are the things you want to do. Uh, Landscaping, landscaping. you know, security screens, air conditioning, better carpet, skylighting. Um, all of these things are, are what uh, you need to do. And again, if you're going to buy an asset, you're not going to put any money into it. You're going to get a return uh, that goes backwards. And I'll talk about the disinvestment rent gap as we go further into the conversation. I mean, look, Literally yesterday I was with Builder and I'm like, um, you know, how can we add some value to this property? And we're, we're skylights. We're going skylights. I've got a very dark room in one of my assets and it's time. It's time to, to add some capital value to the property, which I think I will get a return out of. But again, if you're not factoring it in, the problem is, the problem is not the, co- the cost. It's not factoring the cost is the problem. In other words, if you go in blind and you're like, well, uh, this is you know, something I'm never going to do, guess what happens to the operational costs when you let your property just run down, when you don't replace your, um, your bathroom, your kitchen? And when you think about these costs, these are these are not cheap exercises, right? Uh, I just did a kitchen in one of my properties, twenty two thousand dollars. Now I know, like some people will advocate, well, you just go to Bunnings and you know you just you know you just replace shit with shit, basically. Um, that has its that that just again just speeds up your uh, your future capital goal. In other words, you're just going to run into the problem. I think we've all realized that quality actually lasts longer. It's as simple as that, right? If you buy a better built property, it takes longer to depreciate than a poorly built property. In other words, the asset value lasts longer, which uh, is is just the way it is, right? Just the way it is. And then we got things like future costs which property investors need to consider right thermal scoring electric car charging smart homes solar homes smart lighting smart appliances smart letterbox all of this stuff is is here now right and again um 
if you're not factoring in what these things cost into the future, you, you, you're cheating yourself out of a problem. Remember the conversation going back a step as to what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to end up on with an income producing property. And if we're not, um, you know, if we don't have an income producing property along the way, we're just going to, it's going to cost us more to own it. And that becomes a problem, becomes a burden. It means, shit, I got to go to work today. I got to do more today. I got to put more effort in today because uh, someone's chasing me. And when your property is chasing you, that is not a good feeling, not a good feeling at all. So we've done the risks. Now let's do the gaps. We're going to go through the different gaps when it comes to real estate. The first gap is what I call the location value gap or the location rent gap. Now, again, um, when we analyze the ability for a property to produce cash flow, the idea around it is there's, there's always going to be a differential in rent based on locations. The better locations are going to carry the better rents, but of course, they come at a price. Uh, but, <coughs> excuse me, but if we can get a good location with really, really good appeal, really good mobility, really good lifestyle, really good com commerce, we can get in rental terms a monopoly based rent. In other words, we're going to get more people wanting to live in that area and less properties, which ultimately leads to uh, a rental value increase based on its location. Now, if you look at the uh, highest annual change in rents, the locations are producing more rent than the marketplace uh, is doing. In other words, like for example, North Manly has gone up 41% in rent, 41% this year. Now the market hasn't gone up 41%, but North Manly has. It's a location rent gap. Of course, Manly Beach is a famous place. More people want to live there. So the increase on the location outperforms the rest of the broad marketplace. Location rent gap is what you, you know, you want to get niche with real estate because even within a suburb, nicer streets, leafier streets, streets close to the beach, streets close to the shops, better buildings, get better rent. And again, like the location score of your asset is a direct relative to your cash flow. Now, again, like for a lot of property investors, they they probably, you know, don't understand the consequences of this because for rents to double, it is actually a very, very hard thing for that to do. If you own real estate in a better location, you uh, give yourself a better opportunity for that to actually occur. Why is that important? That is important because if you're becoming a property investor to live off income, you need the journey of time, real estate is time bound, to do its thing. And if you buy an asset and let's say the rent's, I don't know, $350 a week, $400 a week, and you retire in 25 years and that rent is $500 a week, it's a big difference from buying a property which is $500 a week in rent. The rent when you retire is $1,200 a week or $1,000 a week. Huge difference, huge difference to your outcome as a property investor. So the first gap, if you like, is the location value or location rent gap. And uh, it's a critical gap. It's a critical gap. The second gap, is what we call the market value gap or the market rent gap. Now, as we know, uh, we are going into a period of a rental squeeze for tenants. Like everywhere in Australia is a landlord's marketplace and landlords are in charge. So landlords will be putting rents up based on where the market is at. And uh, I saw 
the other day, a suburb which I've never seen before. Um, it's called uh, Greenway in the ACT, and it was at 0%, 0% vacancy, like 0.0. I've never seen that before. Um, and it is testament to where the market is going. The market is undersupplied of real estate and rents for millions of Australians who are s- many people who are struggling. Rents are skyrocketing. And again, um, a lot of this is driven by the fact that we just don't have any stock. Now, again, like I did a podcast recently on five dysfunctions of a team and, you know, I, I don't know if it was a good podcast or a bad podcast, I can't, can't remember, but the attention to detail is the important part. You know, market rents can jump on you and when the market uh, value moves, if you're already under-rented because you haven't paid attention to detail – you know, it can be very, very hard to put up your tenant tenant's rent. If you've got someone there who's paying less than market and, you know, let's say the market rent $600 a week, they're paying, you know, $525. Now the market rent $700 a week, they're paying $525. The gap between where your asset, because, you know, you you, you know you feel sorry for what, or whatever for the tenant, um, is is too big. And of course, there are kind of laws and things like that, you know, as to just how much rent you can put up the property. And of course, this quite often means you need to get rid of the tenant to go back to market. And of course, again, some of this stuff can cause uh, a real problem when it comes to your cash flow profile as a property investor. Um, Market rent or the market gap, if you like, is about understanding where the market is going and where the benchmarks are. And again, if you're under rented or you're out of line with market, it can just mean that uh, you've got a situation where the average weight of your lease has to collapse. In other words, if you're set up wrong in the beginning and you've got a perfectly good tenant that is paying not the right amount of market rent, then all that's going to happen is your lease is going to probably collapse on you, which means you need to go back to operational costs, spend more money, find a new tenant, hope they're as good as the last tenant. And again, if you just pay attention to the details and keep up with market and work with your property manager to make sure you're at a good market level, then you're going to get this sort of better weighted average of time on your lease. And I've got tenants which I've always kept where the market is at and put up my rents um, appropriately, work with some great property managers to do that, to constantly question, well, how do I keep up with market? Where is market going? Uh, putting aside all the sob stories that you can hear as a property investor, you know, um, you you know, and and I've had people staying ten years, ten years in a property, they've never left, um, and again, like they treat the property like it's it's theirs. They 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 look after it so well. Um, and again, like I think all tenants should look after a property, like it's just a common courtesy, like, you know, you're not doing anything special to look after a property, but there is a bit of salt and pepper of love in what they do. And again, a lot of this comes down to just making sure that you're paying attention to the detail when it comes to getting your rents to double over a period of time. But if you've got bad operational costs, if you've got, um, you know, if you're not improving your property, if you're in the wrong location, if you're, you know, subject to problems with insurance, like tenants don't want to live in a property which uh, their stuff's going to get wrecked from, um, you know, problems with, uh, with people stealing stuff, with Gopniks breaking in, with, 
Like they don't want that stuff, right? They don't want these problems. And again, the consensus of, you know, break-ins, of um, street crime, of climate problems, of flooding, that's built into the rental price. And so, again, like for a lot of property investors, they will never see cash flow from real estate because they are set up with the wrong system to achieve the result they're aiming for. The next gap, if you like, is the disinvestment value gap or the disinvestment rent gap. And again, like if you think about how property works, uh, if a property falls behind the standards of the day, if it becomes a property where uh, it is causing appeal issues, if it's actually lessening the value of the neighborhood, it is a disinvested property. And one of the challenges with disinvested properties is, again, it can be a little bit like COVID-19. It can catch on. And of course, disinvested describes the disparity between the current rental income of a property and its potential to achieve further rental income. I'll explain that in a little bit easier dimensions, right? The disinvestment value or rent gap is something I've seen over and over and over again, and it is freaking scary. Basically, what happens is there is a withdrawal from government, from private business, from investors, from communities to even want to go near your property, your street, your neighborhood, your township. And basically, what it does is it locks in basically the less favorable people inside society. And what happens is your property starts to go backwards in value. It starts to underperform from a rental point of view. Uh, All of a sudden, the person who put up with living there, who was, uh, you know, a great blue collar worker or white collar worker moves out. Then you realize you can't find another white collar worker or another great blue collar worker. And all of a sudden you have to get a couple of students in. Then the students sort of stay in the property and there's all of this sort of argy-bargy hoo-ha and, you know, all of a sudden the property for three people, they've got five people living there and they're smoking cones in the, in the garage most weekends and doing parties. All of a sudden, there's more and more and more challenges for your asset. Then the, uh, someone breaks in and basically uh, turns the property upside down and the students don't want to live there. So now you're not even with the students. Then you've got, uh, uh, you're basically going down and you're going further down, further down and further down. And all of a sudden, you're uh, accepting a candidate from Centrelink to live in the property because um, no one else wants to rent the property. They basically are no hoper who, uh, you know, uh, you know, for whatever reasons, um, are being a bit of a no hoper. And so you get the picture, right? Like if you fall, if your asset falls into the disinvestment value or rent gap, it is a freaking nightmare, a freaking nightmare. And again, like, Uh, what the problem is with the disinvestment gap is because usually capital costs um, haven't been invested in the asset, in other words, capital improvements have never happened, you are now so far away that it is just not worth renovating. In other words, uh, the asset to improve it needs to be either knocked down or if you were to renovate it, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars then all of a sudden, the like the 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 gap between what that is and what the the revalue is of the asset and the revalue of the rent of the asset is just not worth it. So what happens is neighborhoods, suburbs, streets, 
properties, buildings, they fall into this category. And, you know, it, it, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And you will never swap your job for income if you go into the wrong suburb, wrong street, wrong property, which is uh, where there's disinvestment around you. And I know there's this kind of like, uh, you know, there's this kind of feeling where it's like, well, uh, most suburbs that you go to, you're seeing improvement. And, um, you know, I like to spend time actually going to suburbs where you're seeing decay because, um, you know, like at the end of the day, you learn something from that. You start to see, well, that's never going to appeal out of, 3,000 properties in that suburb, one guy's renovating. That That is not going to improve the ch- chances of that asset becoming cash flow into the future. So, you know, like, like inequality has a postcode. Um, some of these places steer clear of, um, you know, don't be the boom time investor that jumped in there. Uh, and, you know, the only final thing I've got to say on this is I've seen the downside of this. Uh, hundreds of thousand dollars stripped off the, the value of assets. Um, and again, I've just learned from doing this, like I've been an investor now, I've been in real estate since I'm 18. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm 40, 47. I think I just, I just had my birthday. I think I'm 47. Um, yeah. Like, I've seen it, man. I've seen it. So be careful. Be careful of this stuff because it'll bite you, you know. If, if you've got interest rates into the future that you've got to accommodate, if you've got no extra money in the bank, if you're, you know, um, you know struggling to make ends meet yourself and then you buy this type of real estate, um, geez, it can, it can come back and bite you because if, uh, you know, if that neighborhood goes down, in appeal, be a real problem, be a real problem. Final gap is the tenant value gap or the tenant rent gap. And this is something I've talked about for a while. Inequality is a real thing. If you look at some of the mega trends around the world, you've got things like urbanization, you've got uh, digitalization, you've got climate change, you've got uh, longevity and you've also got inequality in other words there is a rising proportion of the economy of society that just can't keep up with the cost of living and of course um there today is just so many people that are broke like they have no money in the bank they've got like enough to get to the next week or the next month and that's it like they literally have a couple of thousand bucks in the bank or they've got 500 bucks in the bank. And, you know, obviously for many of these people, they've given up on the great Australian dream to own real estate. They've become a renter, a lifetime renter. Now, there's plenty of lifetime renters who are good people. There are plenty of lifetime renters that make more than you as a property investor. I've seen the rental market where tenants are earning huge amounts of money, $200,000, $300,000 a year in income. And for whatever reason, they need to rent during that period. Opposed to that is people who are basically pretty threadbare when it comes to what they earn. And I always describe it. You can have the have tenants who are basically people who are renting a lifestyle, they um, potentially own real estate. They've got a great job. They just want to be closer to the beach. They are what we would refer to as rent a better lifestyle kind of tenant, great tenant. Then you've got people who are basically a week away, two weeks away, five weeks away from being broke. The car breaks down. They've got to spend $3,000 on the mechanic. All of a sudden, they got nothing in the bank and they're late with their rent. The half a week away from broke tenant market is becoming a bigger and bigger problem inside real estate. There is a bit of a battleground when it comes to money. And of course, 
this is one of the big conversations at the moment. You know, you've got uh, the associated costs to spend on things with your wage. Something has to give. Um, if things are going to cost more, if we're not going to earn more or that much more proportion to what things cost, um, then all of a sudden something has to give. And uh, when you think about, you know, typical costs, food, medical, recreation, goods and services, transportation, apparel, housing, um, you know, sometimes there's not enough money to go around. And of course, the lowest quartile and second lowest quartile of people earning in Australia earn something like, you know, 12 times less than the highest quartile of people or the fourth quartile of people, right? So again, like you've got to make sure that you've got a property where you're not getting this broke tenant rent gap. Now, what does that actually look like? Well, this is what it looks like. Some guy earning X amount of money, spending a proportion of their wage, the uh, guy or girls earning you know, a serious amount of money, putting up the rent, a hundred bucks, 150 bucks, ain't an issue to them. It's annoying, but it's not an issue. Then you've got the broke end of town. You put up the rent 20 bucks on them. They ring up and they're like, I can't do it. I've got no money. Um, you know, and you end up settling on a $5 increase. It is lower than CPI. So what happens is your tenant, uh, basically undermines your ability to re-cash flow the property. So what happens is uh, you don't start to repair things. You don't, uh, you know, you you start to be drawn into this kind of dogma of someone else's imperfection and you link what they have to what uh, what you have. And all of a sudden it becomes this nightmare. And of course, like, <laughs> for the lowest and and even sort of some of the middle to low income earners in society, like where they rent, the rents aren't going to double because they won't be able to pay the rent. So the market has to stop at some point. And what I often see is with the rental market, because it is moving so much now, people are getting chased to some locations, they're getting chased out of town, right? Some suburbs are becoming uh, highly prized rental places for people to go. And the broke migrant, if you're like, not as in migrant from overseas, internalized migration, the broke tenant migrate is migrating. And they are looking um, for a cheap option. And again, all of a sudden, you're starting to see this unfold, that there is income disparity. You want a tenant which is going to be able to pay more rent over time. When you buy a property for capital growth purposes, you factor in that someone has to pay more than what you did for growth to happen. When you buy an investment property, you have to factor in someone has to pay more rent for the dwelling in the street in the location, in the neighborhood, you buy the property within. And this basically leads us to the point of this conversation. Remember, as a property investor, there's three key principles to being a property investor. You've got to deploy capital. You've got to activate money, put it into the market, secure assets. You live in a capitalist country. You have to deploy capital. If you don't want to deploy capital, go live in a socialist country. There's plenty of them. I've tried it. I lived in Sweden. Go check it out. You might like it. It's a beautiful place. There's beautiful people, beautiful food. Uh, everyone's fairly similar. Um, you know, deploy your money. Get your capital moving. You've got to buy assets. Then you've got to improve the trajectory of your cash flow. Again, when it comes to the hub and spoke model, what I've talked about today, if you fall into a risk gap or, sorry, uh, if you fall into property risk or a property gap, your rents are not going to improve over time and potentially even your value of your assets are not going to improve over time. So this is why 
your trajectory of your cash flow never changes. Why some properties rents have doubled on and other properties rents are lucky to go up 10% during the ownership of the properties. And so remember, your job as a property investor is to buy growth asset where the cash flow improves. Uh, you can do this by, again, um, uh, making sure that you improve your property investments, right? You can um, do this by buying in a good location. Remember, there is the model of the hub and spoke, which, ah, Rafi, Rafi's come in, he's come in to attack me. Remember, the risks, insurance risk, liquidity risk, operational risk, capital cost risk, the gaps, location, rent gap or value gap, disinvestment rent gap or value gap, market rent gap or value gap and tenant rent gap or value gap. That's it. If you tick all them off, you're going to do well. Anyway, I hope it was a good episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. I better go. Rafi, the Gopnik dog, has come to see me and uh, he's causing trouble. I'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.